today I'd like to tell you a bit about our uh, quantum enhanced super resolution microscopy work. And, uh, but before I delve into the details, let me talk a bit about optical microscopy because optical microscopy is an old science. It has uh, one of the longer histories of, of you know, so science as we know it today. Um, the microscope itself dates back even, even more. But if you look at bioimaging applications, you can sort of trace them back to the early or mid 17th century. If you have to pinpoint a certain time in history when people started performing bioimaging, I would choose uh, the publication of uh, Micrographia, Robert Hooke's book, which uh, in, in, in um, sort of the mid uh, 17th century, in which you have beautiful hand-drawn uh, images of how biological objects look under the microscope. And uh, Hooke himself coined the term cells because, you know, in this image, uh, the, the cells of, of, uh, of a plant reminded him of the cells of a capuchin monk. So, so it's, it's an old device, but in fact, people at the time did not know what is visible under a microscope and not as what is not visible under a microscope. That is, they did not know if the resolution of, of the instrument is limited because of some fundamental limitation or just because we are not adept enough in constructing this device. And to answer this, uh, we had to wait a, a bit of time, about 200 years until 1873. And that's sort of the birth of the optical microscope as we know it, the modern optical microscope. And, and that is due to the fact that these uh, three gentlemen, uh, Ernst Abe on the left, Carl Zeiss in the center, and Otto Schott in the right, uh, happened to be at the same place, Jena, uh, Eastern Germany, uh, at the same time. And uh, Ernst Abbe was a mathematician. And at the time, he wrote this paper with sort of an inconspicuous title, A Contribution to the Theory of the Microscope and the Nature of Microscopic Vision. 1873 is just a few years after Maxwell's equations. And what Abe did in this paper is actually apply Maxwell's equations under tight focusing in, the, in sort of the settings of an optical microscope. And this is not, you know, a, a paper which you would give your students to read on, on, you know, on how to write papers. It's very long. It's very tedious. Um, it's uh, hard to go through and there are no equations. But if you go through the text, you know, Ernst Abbe writes at some point, no particles can be resolved. And then there's a lot of text. And then there's the famous Abbe formula dividing the wavelength by the sign of half the aperture and half of that for oblique illumination. And, and therefore, Abbe realized that the limitation of an optical microscope is, is really fundamental physics. You cannot resolve something which is smaller than the wavelength. And the greatness of the three people that, that are uh, shown in this, uh, in this slide is the fact that uh, in his side, Ernst Abbe had these two amazing engineer, uh, Carl Zeiss and Otto Schott, the glassmaker, who could actually make the lens designs, the rather aberration-free lens designs that, made, uh, that Ernst Abbe made and essentially got to the limit that Ernst Abbe formulated very, very quickly. And today's optical microscopes are not very different. So today's designs of Carl Zeiss are not very different than what Carl Zeiss made 150 years ago. Okay, so, so you could say that the sort of the science of quantitative optical microscopy um, was born in 1873 and died immediately after because the utmost limit of resolution has already been achieved. Or was it, you know? So, so it took us somehow, sort of hard to answer why, 120 years to start questioning the Abbe limit. Can you actually get in a far field optical microscope resolution which is better than the diffraction limit? And something was in the air in the mid 90s, so um, 25, 30 years ago, when people started considering this question. And uh, among the pioneers of this was, was Stefan Hell, later the Nobel Prize. We'll say a few words about him later. Uh, and, you know, people started 
considering what were the assumptions in the Abe model. And if you read the Abe paper, you see that he makes many assumptions like linear optics, like obviously classical fields because quantum mechanics was not there in 1873, like the fact that the sample is time independent, the illumination is homogeneous, there are no sources of extra information. And each of these properties presents a loophole through which you can break the diffraction barrier, which actually makes sense, right? And, and you can make a clear connection between any super resolution modality known today and a broken assumption. So let me uh, show you in the next two slides a couple, and then I'll talk about breaking the fact that you have classical fields or how can we use quantum principles to break the diffraction barrier. So one Nobel Prize winning technique, so for the 2014 Nobel Prize awarded to Stefan Hill was on stimulated emission depletion. And this is a technique which is based on uh, breaking the linearity assumption. And it's, it's based on the following idea. You make a excitation spot, which is diffraction limited, and then you take a second beam, which serves as sort of as an eraser beam. It erases the fluorescence everywhere uh, where there's intensity. And if you make this eraser beam donut shaped, then it erases all the fluorescence except at the very center of the donut, leaving uh, fluorescence in a very small volume, which then you can sort of, without breaking actually the diffraction limit in image, you can assign the fluorescent photons to that small spot. Another well-known method is, is Palm or Storm, uh, which, you know, invented by Eric Betzig, um, for which he got the Nobel Prize also. And that involves the fact that optics is very good at measuring centroids well beyond the diffraction limit or the transfer limit. There you're limited only by signal to noise. But of course, in a dense scene, uh, you, you, it's useless to measure centroids. So the, the ingenious idea here was to make the sample time, in, time dependent rather than time independent using photo switchable fluorescent molecules. So what do you do? You switch off all your molecules, then you switch a small sub ensemble on, so small that the molecules are really separated. Then you can measure accurately the centroid of each one mark an X in that location, turn all these off, and then repeat this again and again and again and again and again until you get the distribution of the positions of the Xs. So it's wide field, but needs photoactivable or reversibly photobleachable molecules. It's sort of quite slow because it takes maybe 10,000 frames to do this. So here, let, let's go to the main part of the talk. I'll, I'll talk about quantum emitters and anti-bunching as a poor man's quantum resource in imaging, because we need to use a realistic quantum resource. And then I'll tell you about quantum super resolution microscopy by photon correlations, which is a nice demo, but is completely impractical. And then go to quantum assistant confocal microscopy, which actually may be practical. And then I'll sort of conclude. So the quantum resource that we use is not anything you know, if you know from fancy quantum optics, it's not uh, EPR pairs of correlated entangled photons, but rather uh, the photon statistics from quantum emitters. So a quantum emitter is a fancy name for a very small object that emits fluorescent light. And in fact, most fluorescent markers used in biology are by their very nature quantum emitters, be they dye, molecular dyes or uh, fluorescent proteins. And the whole point of a quantum emitter is that it can only emit one photon at a time. And that's easy because if it just emitted a photon, that means it's in the ground state and it takes a time to get re-excited. And how do you know that an emitter is quantum? Well, you take the stream of light from this quantum emitter and put it into this Hanbury Brown twist setup, which is nothing but a beam splitter, two single photon detectors, and the correlator that correlates the photon stream. And if this is really a quantum emitter, you know that because photons cannot be split into two by this beam splitter, a photon will go either here or there, but you'll never get two clicks simultaneously from both detectors. And if you plot the cross correlation between the two detectors, you'll have some background level and then at zero delay, you'll have no pairs, which is this dip, which is what we call anti-bunching. 
You can think of anti-bunching as, you know, there's some mechanism, which is a bouncer, like, like this guy standing on the top of the water slide. If you look at the kids from the pool side, you see that they're coming out one by one. You never see two kids simultaneously entering the pool. And therefore, if you plot the correlation, you'll see anti-bunching of kids at the pool. This is in contrast to say bunching, which is what you'd see at the entrance to the pub when people enter in groups. And that's the effect used by Henry Brown and Twist for stellar interferometry. And anti-bunching is really easy to measure nowadays, right? All you need is a laser source of your choice, a quantum emitter and a beam splitter, two single photon detectors. This is for pulsed excitation of a single quantum dot. You see that there are no correlations or almost no correlations at zero delay. And what a quantum emitter means is that the photon stream is actually more uniformly distributed in time. Right? If you count how many photons arrive at the unit time, that number, and you look at the distribution of that number, the distribution would be narrower than shot noise. And that's why it's sort of a quantum effect that cannot be mimicked by any classical analog. And this is what we're going to use. We're going to look at the signal, which is the deviation of the photon statistics from a Poisson distribution or from a classical phenomenon. So why is there enhanced resolution encoded in this anti-bunching effect? So Stefan Hill in 1995 uh, proposed the Gedanken experiment, which sort of makes it easy to understand. Suppose we have an emitter that always emits photons in pairs, and we have the ability to detect photon pairs. Can we resolve that emitter better than what we can do with a standard microscope? The answer is yes. How do you do this? You use a Hanbury Brown and Twist setup now with two cameras, and you only look at events. These are two hypothetical cameras, really fast, really sensitive. And you only look at events where one photon hit one camera and the other hit the other camera. Now, the position that this photon hit this camera is an estimator of the position of the emitter. And just the same, the position that this photon hit this camera is an estimator of the position of the emitter. Whenever you have two independent estimates, which are better than one. So you can estimate the position of the emitter better than what you can classically do. You have to multiply if you want the point spread functions and get a narrower point spread function. But now we don't have these emitters that emit pairs of photons simultaneously, but we have zillions of emitters that never emit photons in pairs. So instead of looking at the pairs, you can look at the missing photon pairs and this is the anti-bunching signal. So how can you experimentally implement this? Experiment is actually very easy, right? You take a pulsed laser that operates uh, at the same rate as a single photon sensitive camera, in this case, an EMCCD operating at one kilohertz. So you have one excitation pulse per frame and you make sure the pulses are so short that you cannot re-excite the emitter, so much shorter than the radiative decay of the emitter. You cannot re-excite it within the pulse. And now you look at correlations, you oversample so that every diffraction limited spot is imaged onto several pixels here, and you measure the correlations. That's a very simple experiment. Uh, and indeed, if you do this, you see that the linear sign signal, linear fluorescence, has worse resolution than the anti-bunching signal and worse resolution than the third order, so the missing triplets of photons. But if you look at the magnitude of the signal here, you have ten, hundreds of thousands of photons per, uh, per experiment. The experiment took an hour here. It's uh, uh, 36,000 seconds, so 3 million pulses and only several hundreds of missing pairs and only a handful of missing triplets. So, so you get better resolution, but it slows down your, your measurement extremely. So it's, it's quite impractical. And that is because your imaging is limited by the frame rate of the camera. So you need a fast camera, but one that still is able to measure photon correlations. So not having a camera like that at hand, we had to construct one. 
and uh, standard cameras are noisy and not fast enough, you want something which is like a single photon detector, like an avalanche photodiode. So our makeshift camera was a fiber bundle where each of the fibers in the bundle fans out to a different avalanche photodiode. We used 15 avalanche photodiodes. Um, and that's because we had a 16 channel correlator. We needed one channel for the trigger. And so you can think of this as a 15 pixel camera, which can measure simultaneous spatial temporal correlations across this entire 15 pixel image. But now there's not much that you can do with 15 pixels. So we had to find a, a good application like improving confocal microscopy. So a confocal microscope is you know, devi a device invented by Marvin Minsky in the 50s. And it was intended to improve the axial resolution, not the lateral resolution of, of imaging. And it was well known already from the beginning that you can use a, confo a confocal in which you image the fluorescence onto a pinhole and only then onto your detector. You can improve the axial, the lateral resolution if you close the pinhole sufficiently. But if you close the pinhole, you lose almost all the fluorescence. So maybe you lose 90% of the fluorescence in order to gain a factor of square root of two in resolution. And that doesn't make sense. And intuitively, if you replace this pinhole with an array of pinholes, which is just a, a pixelated detector, you could recover this enhanced resolution uh, with no penalty on the signal intensity. This idea was brought up by Colin Shepard uh, and then experimentally demonstrated some 20 years later by Jörg Enderlein with the whole uh, simple notion that if you have different detectors in your pixelated camera, each has a slightly different parallax onto the sample. So it sees a slightly shifted image. So instead of just summing up the images from the different detectors, you have to first shift them to overlap and then sum them up. And you get a factor of square root of two increase in resolution and a factor of two with Fourier analysis. So how do you implement this with photon correlations? Well, each emitter is a source of missing pairs and the missing pair is associated with two excitation, two detection events. You can think of sort of the same math. If you have your excitation spot here, this is exaggerated. These are the detectors. You're going to look at correlations between detectors X1 and X2. So you first have to multiply the excitation point spread function with the detection point spread function, get this green uh, point spread function. But now with two detectors, you have to multiply two of these green point spread functions and get smaller point spread function, so a better resolution with potentially a four times enhancement, uh, directly a two times enhancement in resolution. And indeed this works. So this is two isolated uh, quantum dots. Of course, they cannot be resolved by a standard confocal microscope. They can barely be resolved by uh, this pixelated version, image scanning microscopy, uh, this pixelated version of a confocal. But now with a missing pair signal, they can be readily resolved. And of course, applying some mathematical Wiener filtering or Fourier weighting, you can improve resolution here. And since this is a confocal and the detector is fast, you can actually apply this to a biological sample. So these are microtubules, sorry, labeled with quantum dots. And, and that's, that actually works. Uh, but of course, you know, using a hundred thousand, give or take, maybe $150,000 detector, makeshift detector uh, for imaging is hard, especially if you want, you know, a biologist to construct a fiber bundle camera, the correlator, the software, et cetera. You have to find a commercial detector that can actually do this. So measure simultaneously photon correlations across a small image. Um, Luckily for us, in the past few years, avalanche photodiode arrays, monolithic avalanche photodiode arrays, it's based on CMOS technology. So at the price of your cell phone camera, if you want, uh, have, have become available and are dramatically improving. There's issues here with using them for um, photon correlation measurements, but actually you can do this. So, so this is an image, you know, showing the resolution of a confocal and ISM and the quantum ISM uh, using a spatter rate like this.
So I think photon correlations are going to become more and more abundantly used now that these uh, cheap scalable detectors are available. So to conclude, uh, I've shown you the first demonstration of photon statistics or quantum subdiffraction limited imaging. And I think monolithic spatter rays are a game changer and they'll enable scale up and practical implementation as a fast camera, single photon sensitive, enabling correlations. So quantum imaging may be a bit less esoteric than what you may think. And just before I finish, I want to thank the people who did the work, uh, a bunch of really talented students, uh, Radek Lapkiewicz from Warsaw for the collaboration, Michel, Claudio, Eduardo from EPFL for their help with the detectors, Yonin Eldar for algorithms, and Jaron Silberberg for a lot of inspiration um, and funding. And thank you for your attention.